Hey folks! Today I thought we'll have a look at a really popular case study called Iceland. Iceland is uh, an amazing country that I've been lucky enough to go to uh, a number of occasions now. Roughly speaking it's that kind of shape, so if you want to draw that in the middle of your page. And it's a really special country because it has something called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge running all the way through it. We're on the diagonal, kind of this sort of angle. So the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is where the Eurasian Plate and the North American Plate are moving apart from each other. So Iceland is sitting on a constructive plate boundary. So I'll just pop that in there. Constructive plate boundary. Now, in Iceland, if you go there on holiday or you've, you've been lucky enough to go to school, um, there are places where you can stand between these two plates. Uh, you can walk between them. There is a literal gap. Uh, there's one company that will even take you scuba diving between them. Uh, so let's just name them. We've got the Eurasian plate. Let me go to the east. And then we've got the North American plate to the west. Now they're not moving apart very fast. Uh, it's about two and a half centimetres a year. It's about the same kind of distance um, your nails or your hair grow. So just put in brackets, 2.5 centimetres per year. Um, but what's happening here is we've got magma forming you know, down in the mantle layer and rising up and creating what is Iceland. Iceland is one of the newest countries on, on the planet. Um, now it has oh, lots, let me think, it's 130 volcanoes in total. I'm just going to draw some rough volcano shapes like this all along the ridge and a few more close to Reykjavik where you fly into. Now luckily not all of them are active, only 32 are actually active. But let's just pop an arrow there. So in total we said there were 130 volcanoes that run all across Iceland. There are more, they're more than just this area. I'm just highlighting those ones. Um, so across Iceland. And only 32 are actually active. But those 32 are very active. Um, so it's 2024 as I'm recording this and there is currently an eruption taking place near Grindavik on the south of Ireland, Iceland, um, of the island, which has unfortunately uh, destroyed quite a lot of property and it's quite, um, it's quite large and it's quite ongoing. Katla is due to erupt very soon. Um, as, as I'm filming this, there are lots of earthquakes happening around Katla and Katla is about five times bigger than Eyjafjallajökull, which is the one that went off in 2010. Uh, so it, these are properly active. Um, they have eruptions every five years, roughly. And that can be massive ones like we've seen before, or it can be like slow, viscous, sticky um, eruptions from fissures. So eruptions every five years on average. We're overdue at the moment for another big eruption. <laughs> Um, now, they also, I'm just going to draw a crack in the land like this, uh, they also get earthquakes, far more earthquakes than volcanic eruptions. Um, they have approximately 500 per week. Now, most of them, obviously very small, a lot of them you won't feel at all but some of them are large enough to quite literally pull the ground apart. And where we stay when we go to Iceland, it's really visible in the uh, shopping mall across the road. It's actually sort of put lights in it. And you can see this big crack that extends down into the ground. They've glassed over so you can walk over it. But yeah, they have, they have really big eruptions and um, also very big earthquakes. 
So why do people live there? Let's have a think. So one of the main reasons that people live there, and this is kind of a benefit, I suppose, is geothermal energy. Now, this is really common um, to come up in your exams at AQA or another geography board. Um, Iceland is 100% green. They don't use any fossil fuels for their electricity. And one of the big things that they do is they use geothermal energy to create electricity and hot water, just using the heat from the mantle. Okay, just realised we haven't written Iceland anywhere. Let's pop Iceland in there. Okay, perfect. So geothermal energy. Now, 25% of their electricity comes from geothermal energy and 100% of their hot water comes from geothermal energy. So with the hot water, they quite literally pipe it into people's homes um, at a decent sort of hot temperature. Um, they don't have boilers like we, had, we do in the UK. It's just piped in, super hot, um, but not enough to really, really burn you, but really hot water. And then the other thing they do is they turn some of that um, hot water into steam, which they use to spin turbines to create electricity. Where do they get the rest of, your, of their electricity, I hear you say? <laughs> so the other part of the electricity comes from water. Iceland is really lucky. It has a lot of waterfalls. I'm just going to colour that in. It's supposed to be a water droplet. Looks a bit more like a leaf, but there we go. Um, so, waterfalls, lots of incredible waterfalls, some really, really big ones. Um, and what they do with that is they create 75% uh, of electricity from, and they have a, it has a proper name. Okay, so it's hydro. Electricity. Hydro basically means water. So hydroelectricity. Not all of Iceland's waterfalls are used for this. Um, they don't need to use all of them. But all that glacial melt, all that lovely water coming off the mountains and off the volcanoes, they can use the speed of that water to spin turbines to create electricity. But this basically means that Iceland is 100% renewable, renewable power. Okay, so it's really, really clean. Now, that's an amazing way to save money. They're not having to import fuel from anywhere. Um, but there's other ways to make money in Iceland, and this is another reason why people live there. So, tourism. As I said, I've been there quite a few times now. I know lots of people, it's like top of their bucket list to go somewhere like Iceland. Um, and there's good reason. So, these are some of the things that you can do. Okay, so one of them, obviously, is to go visit those waterfalls. Lots of people go there. When you get to the waterfall, there's very often a gift shop, somewhere you can buy beautiful Icelandic uh, woolen goods like gloves and scarves and jumpers, um, or just mugs and hats and, you know, trinkets and things to take home. Uh, they also have things called hot springs. These are natural these hot springs. Um, some of them you can bathe in, like the Blue Lagoon is a classic one, or the Secret Lagoon, which we go to, which is even better, I think. Um, and they're just really lovely, natural, kind of like natural hot tubs, I suppose. Um, they also have something called geysers, and that's spelled like that, geysers. Um, they are naturally occurring, a bit like a hot tub, but they shoot water out. I don't know if I do, do a drawing like this. They shoot water out of the ground. There's one that's very famous um, that we go to visit it's every sort of 60 seconds, and it's super impressive. Lots of people go there. Again, gift shops, restaurants, you know, cashing in. Um, then there's the lava fields from previous eruptions. Absolutely stunning, you know, um, lava fields that almost look like crumbled up cake now that's gone a bit mouldy. Some of it's covered in green mosses, which is very otherworldly. Doesn't look 
anything like the UK, for example. Um, then you can go visit the volcanoes. And there's lots of elaborate ways you can do this. People can take helicopter tours, you can climb them. There's one that's dormant that we go to that you can walk around the crater of, which is just incredible. It has a small glacial lake in the bottom, uh, in, the, in the chamber. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Volcanoes are a big draw. And then they also have glaciers. Now, we go visit a glacier, we go up to one, but we don't climb it, but you can put on ice boots and, um, you know, the ones with proper grips and go climb them. Now, all of these, all of this equates to 1.3 billion US dollars per year in revenue. So you can see this is not a small business. This is a huge business. Um, and there's a very small population in Iceland, you know, very, very small, sort of similar to the population of Portsmouth, around 200,000 people. Um, so this is a large amount of money for a small population to bring in. So, yeah, people are, are pretty wealthy in Iceland. Uh, let's see, what else is good? They have this area here, this kind of southern area here, this, I'll just kind of block it off a bit. Um, very fertile soils. Now you might think, how can they grow anything? But in the summer months, this area in the sort of south of Iceland, they can use that and they can grow crops in that short window, sort of three month window uh, for farming. And the, and the reason they're so fertile is because of all those volcanoes over the years that have left um, ash in the ground. Ash is full of nitrogen. It's a great sort of soil improver and it helps things grow. Okay, moving over here now. Let's just notice we need to label our our boundary here. So this is the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Mid Atlantic Ridge. It's great if you can remember these keywords when you're in an exam, which is why I try and keep these infographics just so simple. Just keep it to what you need to know. Um, so it's the Mid Atlantic Ridge that is pulling Iceland apart. Okay, helping it grow by around two and a half centimeters a year. Okay, so we're living in Iceland. Imagine we're living there. Why are we living there when we're at risk? We're at risk of volcanoes and earthquakes. Well, there's different ways to lower the risk. So if you write lowering the risk, and this is a classic exam question as well. They absolutely love to ask you how places can be made more safe. Now, a lot of what I'm gonna put in here will apply to Japan and to San Francisco and other countries, high-income countries, where there's money and resources. So the first thing is earthquake-resistant buildings. I never say uh, that earthquake, um, things are earthquake-proof, because they're not. There's no earthquake that a building can withstand. You know, there could be an even larger earthquake and it will unfortunately crumble, but they can make them resistant. So that means for most earthquakes, they should remain standing. Now, what that essentially means is they might put in things like cross structures, like I'm drawing on here. Cross structures are steel supports in a cross structure, cross frame, that allow the building to twist and not collapse, not fall, like a pack of cards. Um, they have other methods as well, but that's just one that you can use. Uh, then we have got our monitoring. Uh, monitoring of everything, really. They monitor earthquakes, they monitor um, volcanoes, and evacuation warnings. So nowadays, you might not get much notice, but you're likely to get notice to allow you to basically move to a safe place. So with monitoring, they can use things called satellites up in space. And these satellites detect heat so they can look and see, you know, if a volcano is looking and it's getting hotter, for example, so they can detect heat. They can also check like subtle changes um, in the shape or size of the volcano. If there's a bulge, for example. 
Uh, the other thing they can do with monitoring is they can use something called a seismograph. And that measures seismic activity. So seismographs can basically they record microquakes, microquakes. So these are like really small earthquakes that might swarm a bit. So you might get three, four, five hundred earthquakes, really small ones, right before you get one massive earthquake or right before a volcano will erupt. So seismographs are really useful for that. Um, children in, Earth, in Iceland in schools will do earthquake drills, much like we have fire drills here. Um, it's helping you know where to go, what to do. The norm is, is a kind of drop, cover, hold procedure. So that they'll learn to go drop under a desk or a bed, hold on, um, and just yeah, make sure your head is covered. Um, then they do something called hazard mapping. Now, this is a little bit more complex. This is where you would take a map of Iceland and you would look at all the different risks and you kind of map it out, you colour code it, if you like, to work out which are the most dangerous areas. And then with that, you put in place something called a risk assessment. So if you are living or working or going to school in an area that's, say, red, for example, then you are more prepared, more informed than areas that might be green. So there you go, nice and short and sweet. That is Iceland and what's happening there in terms of tectonic activity, why people are choosing to live there and how they can lower the risk.